In this video, learn everything that you need to know about metal roofing systems, starting now. Hey, what's up? I'm Matt, and I've helped tens of thousands of people build rewarding careers as independent property insurance adjusters. So let's go ahead and get started with this video on metal roofing. Different kinds of metal you see in residential applications are metal shingles, which are real similar to other assemblies that we've been talking about, and uh, metal panels which there's also nuances within that group. Metal shingles get put together, um, just they're smaller panels, shall we say. Um, those get interlocked together the same way that shingles overlap each other. Um, the fun thing with metal is that you can do these unique closures of which there's a wide different variety of them. They can have a texture to them so that they look like granulated surfaces, like rolled roofing. They can do some really beautiful stuff with finished coats now. Um, but in fundamental nature, there's a system of the metal shingles interlocking, being fastened to a batten system and then um, being tying the roof together over the underlayment system below it. Same two basic categories, where you have the top surface of the, um, the roof cover over an underlayment. Metal shingles are seen in a variety of different spots with, with some architectural versus functional damage issues. Um, the coatings on these uh, are important to the cover, but can be dented without necessarily being functional damage. Um, metal shingles, because of that batten system, there's a space in between the two that makes them sometimes more prone to those dents, which put us in that situation of making that call. Is this functional damage that has impacted its weather resistive or life's expectancy, or is this just an aesthetic issue? Um, you know, these are looked at differently than you would look at dents in the car because you look at a roof from the curb of, of your house. And policy language is catching up to this definition, but often that's an important call you need to make with these. I deal with that with metal shingles more than just about any other roof covering because they're so prone to denting. And then there's that discussion where you need to categorize. Is this a functional damage or is this just something aesthetic that we're dealing with? Metal panels are usually a little heavier gauge than the shingles. Um, and just because of their geometry, of the way that that panel is manufactured, often they're on a more significant substrate or they're a structural panel, which is a thicker gauge of metal. Um, and they're a little more durable. Um, you do see metal panels often in commercial applications for this, but we see them in residential um, in different configurations because they work uh, for smaller roofs as well. I have one in my house. Um, they're, a lot, they're, they're good to put together because you can deal with them in large panels and screw them down. Um, the key to all of metal panel construction and how they're damaged, whether it's functionally or aesthetically, really comes down to our perimeters and our penetrations. The metal panel requires, you know, I've seen them hit with three inch hailstones, which is a humbling kind of storm event, and it still ends up being a dent in it. It's diff that dent you know, is very different than a functional damage where we can some get some decrease in its weatherproofing. When you start hitting the laps and the joints is where we can start breaking that assembly apart. And these typically require more significant hailstones, but still that's that spot where the perimeter and the penetration of the panel can be a spot where you can get functional damage. Um, as we talk about some of the examples of this, we'll see that's where you would focus in when you're doing an investigation. These metal panels are coated. Usually it's in an in a, in a baked on epoxy coating, a manufactured coating that's put on there. If that coating, that coating, its modulus of elasticity is very similar to the metal. So when you hit a metal panel, you stretch it slightly. Its bottom side gets put in tension and stretches a little, and the top side gets put a little bit in compression. Um, if you get a significant enough dent, it can start to tear that epoxy coating, and now you've got exposed metal. Um, so theoretically, yes, um, that can happen. You need to look at those areas of damage to make sure about it. We, we do sometimes where those cases are, are called for, we'll pull a panel, flip it over, and you can microscopically look at it to see if you've got fractures in it. That is a much less common kind of damage. By the time you've got the energy to dent a metal panel, and usually in residential applications, it's sitting on top of a, a substrate, a sheathing, plywood, uh, OSB. Before you can get enough energy to dent that panel that the bottom side gets um, it's stretched enough to tear that coating, you're often seeing significant damage elsewhere too to the seams. Um, so because that roof affects all the appurtenances that we were talking about earlier, um, the canary is often those laps, I find. The, the canary in the coal mine that gets the first element of damage when we start seeing those laps get flattened because there's a lot of energy in a hailstone that, that's strong enough to dent a metal panel to tears the coating. You do want to get it accurate. You want to make the right call when you're out there. And so 
if there's going to be damage there, you should look in the areas first where it's most likely to have occurred. There is only one company that provides E&O and general liability insurance solely to the insurance industry, and that's Kaplik. They even have drone and cyber coverages. Download the free guide all about the different kinds of insurance that you as the adjuster should carry at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. If you're gonna make a right call, you should look at the best evidence and looking at the most vulnerable aspects of a roof. And if you don't see any damage in any of those, it's less likely you're gonna see damage in the more durable parts of the roof. Um, so just to make sure that you're going after the truth and getting the facts, um, you should focus your time on the areas where you're gonna probably see the most damage. You described, I think, very well what the average adjuster is going through. You've got 10 roofs to get to in an eight hour period. You've gotta make every minute count. So hopefully with this kind of information we'll be covering in this presentation, you can know where to focus your time the best to find the truth, not about it. The ones that take you the longest are the ones where they have light damage. If, they have, yep. if it's big, bad damage, you're off the roof in 10 minutes. Yeah, and for me as the forensic engineer, you know, I'm, I get called in as a specialist. I work in that gray area all the time. Just about every roof I get on is, you know, there's already been an adjuster often that's going up on it, and there was some aspect of it that they weren't 100% certain on for whether it was an area outside their area of expertise or if it was a weird call or unique material. Um, that gray area is, is where a forensic engineer works almost exclusively. And so there isn't a clear cut answer. You, know, you, you do have to focus on those areas where, um, you know, does this make sense as an area? There could be multiple sources of damage that you have to help identify. We're, we're always trying to figure out those tricky ones. Metal panels. There's two main categories. There's architectural and structural. Architectural panels are what we come across much more commonly in residential applications. They're lighter gauge, typically about like 26 gauge metal. Um, and they're all put on solid sheathing, which is what we were talking about when we were talking about dents. Structural panels are basic, uh, basically similar in construction. They're just a long rectangular panel section but they can be of heavier gauge and they don't require that sheathing underneath them. They're usually framed in between purlins and a, a truss work that's put underneath them. Because of that, the structural panel spans across an opening um, and it's usually a heavier gauge metal. And because it's thicker metal, um, you don't see damage with the smaller hailstones that you can see with, um, with residential panels, architectural panels. All these systems come together at laps and seams. Those laps and seams are a little more vulnerable of an area on the panel and where you can get it particularly the lower slope panels are very reliant on a sealant or a mastic or tape um, that's in between those panel laps. And so that's a spot where you can start seeing the, the crushing of the lap resulting in a spot where now water can get in there it wasn't before. That's a decrease in the weather shedding capacity of it. So those edges, the perimeters and penetrations are where it's often good to spend your time when you're on a metal roof. Um, if you see a hole through the center of the roof, it's one, it's probably not a job I got called out for. That's pretty obvious damage. But those, are the, the, those edges are the spot where you, if you focus your time there, you can start seeing the smaller aspects, which technically can be damaged or cannot, depending on how you look at it. Panel systems are put together um, in, a, in assemblies of pieces, and usually they're held together with screws. Um, you can use rivets, even nails in some locations, but screws with, with grommets on the end, uh, washers are the most common way they put together. Those are another area you want to focus on, but typically that screw head put into its solid sub substrate is one of the stronger pieces on that roof. It just has a, a joint around it that needs to be weather tight, so you can look at those edges of those penetrations. All these systems, when we're talking about architectural panels, are put under an underlayment system. Uh, metal panels, in my opinion, are leaky on their top surface. All those laps and seams often get a little bit of water underneath them, so that underlayment system is what's required to keep keep that weather from the, uh, on the top of the roof rather than dripping in through it. Very similar to what we we're talking about, the asphalt shingles and wood shakes. That underlayment provides a duty to the overall assembly. Um, typically you'll see our damage just to the top surface, but and the underlayment, that does cause some weathering, which isn't related to a single weather event. But you need to look at both of those because we'll get called out and there'll just be water on the inside. And there may be a dent in the top, but if you don't know how it worked its way through that underlayment system, there can be different sources with it. There are, there are a lot of honest people that notice leaks after hailstorms that are actually the results of just it, their roof was wearing out. Those leaks that may have been going on longer and they didn't put their attention up to there. So making that call is important here and you have to understand all the pieces to make the right call. People will ask, well, how can, how can we get a, 
rain coming in when there's no damage to the outside of the house. When it's coming in sideways at 100 miles an hour, the house really wasn't designed to handle that as much, as often. Um, yeah. So it's going to overcome that. It's basically the design of the house a little bit. And water finds a pinhole and it's, gonna, it's coming in. I think of two big things in what you just said. One, a hygric buffer is what I refer to it as. Basically, houses are kind of like sponges. And you get that small little pinhole in the right storm. Yes, a little bit of water probably gets in through that pinhole, but it's not enough to soak in through the exterior sheathing, through your, your insulation, the stud, and make it all the way to the inside. You get that 100 mile an hour rainstorm with rain going sideways at three inches per hour. There's enough water to soak up that sponge to fill the hygric buffer, and now they start seeing inside damage. So that's where people can notice water after you know, that more significant storm. There's also the personal attention part. Most people are unaware of the assemblies that their houses are made of. They could have areas that are leaking, and it's not until they notice the roofing trucks in their neighborhood, they start looking at their own roof more critically. But what's interesting about this career line is that we don't just work on houses, we work on homes. They're unique to every individual. They're put together by human hands and they end up with the most complicated assembly of stuff that's still done by hand. There's a unique aspect to every house. So that's why I like to think of that I'm going to people's homes to meet with that person and look at their space. And while I have a good understanding of how a house is built, that's the first time you understand how their home is built and maintained. And so there's unique aspects to all these that, you know, we can't give you a presentation on how to do Joe Smith's house but we can do a presentation on how to work on houses like Joe Smith lives in. And then you go meet Joe. Watch every part of a residential roof replacement in real time right here.